Unit 6, Part 2, Container Growing. Um, the next set of slides will give us a look at container growing. Um, and we'll consider some of the various aspects of container growing, such as container selection, potting or growing mix, crop selection, and the inputs required for such a system. What is container growing? Container growing encompasses a wide range of growing conditions and containers. Just about anything that can be used as a container can be used in container growing. Um, at its most basic, container growing can be as simple as growing herbs in a flower pot on a windowsill, but much more elaborate systems are possible. Almost anything can be used as a container for container growing, but while raised beds might be technically considered a container of sort, they're not usually considered as such since at the bottom they're open to the underlying soil. Container gardening is simply that, growing plants in containers, but there are a few things to consider that make this a different thing than um, growing the same types of plants in soil outdoors. And that is most importantly, probably, soil that's perfectly adequate or even excellent garden soil outdoors isn't suitable for containers. For various reasons, the soil used in containers must be much more porous than regular garden soil. This generally means that container soil or growing medium must be heavily amended with things such as peat moss, perlite, composted shredded bark, or you can use commercial potting soil. Many growers use completely soilless mixes to achieve the porosity required and also to reduce weight. And containers may be regular flower pot type containers, recycled containers of all sorts, or specially built containers to fit a purpose and a space. Container selection. Most containers can be used for container growing from regular clay flower, flower pots to recycled five gallon buckets to purpose built trays. However, the shape of the container will have an impact on the water retention ability of the growing mix. Very short containers such as flat trays don't drain as well as taller containers given the same growing mix in both. What I mean here is that if you have a, a low flat container, you fill it with water, water until the soil is saturated, let the water in the soil drain out. There will be more water retained in the remaining soil than if that container were contain the same amount of soil but were taller and narrower. So inversely, very tall, narrow containers might drain too quickly. So really ideal containers are medium-sized containers whose height and width are close to a one-to-one -one ratio. They provide a good balance of drainage, airspace, and water retention. Growing media. Um, as I said previously, soil that's perfectly adequate outdoors is likely to be really poor for indoor or container growing, even if the containers are outdoors. The soil used in containers must be much more porous than regular garden soil in order to provide sufficient air pore space to the plant roots. Notice that soil is in parentheses there because many growing mixes used in container growing contain no actual soil at all, but are rather a mix of things like composted shredded bark, perlite, or coir. When using artificial mixes, especially those containing a high percentage of shredded bark, you have to take care to provide adequate nitrogen in the fertilizer that you use. Because nitrogen is used by the process of decomposition of the cellulose in the shredded bark. That process consumes large amounts of nitrogen and may leave little nitrogen left for the plant. So when materials such as shredded bark are used, be sure to monitor 
the nitrogen levels. Crop selection? Well, almost anything that you can grow in a regular garden can be grown in a container. But certain plants may give inadequate yields for the effort that you have to put out uh, when grown in containers. Almost any herb, basil, rosemary, sage, oregano, that sort of thing, produced, can be produced in containers with really good yields. Tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers can give excellent yields in containers. Uh, though with tomatoes and cucumbers, of course, you have to give them adequate room to spread out above the container, just like you would in a garden. Um, crops such as corn generally don't give high enough yields to make commercial container growing profitable. Um, though I've seen really nice, healthy sweet corn grown in five gallon buckets in winter in a greenhouse. So it really depends on the effort that you're willing to put in uh, for the yield that you expect to get. Inputs, well, with container gardening, inputs are everything from the containers to the growing mix to the water to whatever fertilizer is used because the containers are an isolated environment to themselves. So everything is essentially an input. Containers can make more efficient use of some inputs, such as water and fertilizer, than tradition gro traditional growing methods, simply because there can be less runoff, and you can be sure that most of it is going to be used. Also, water can be captured as it drains from the containers and recycled. You can also use drip irrigation systems that give lower water loss from evaporation than traditional sprinkler systems or traditionally hand watering over um, a regular garden. Fertilizers can be very precisely applied in containers. You know exactly the volume that you're dealing with, the number of plants that you are dealing with and that sort of thing. So you can precisely apply it to help prevent loss and pollution from runoff. And the runoff water can still be captured as we mentioned and recycled and that will help reuse any nutrients that may have leached through the soil. Growing media may well be the biggest input required in container growing. And I'll go so far to say it is the single biggest input required. Um, though the media can be recycled. However, between uses, it should usually be sterilized. Um, and that can add expense and time. The typical method of sterilization of uh, a container system is to empty all of the containers of the growing media, pour the growing media into uh, some type of a bin, take out the plant uh, remains of the plant that might be in there, the plant roots, shake off as much of the growing media as possible from the plant roots, take the uh, plant waste and roots, put them into a uh, composting system so that they can become a part of the inputs later, and then, um, use heat, in the form, usually in the form of steam, uh, to heat the container mix. If you heat it above 160 degrees for 20 minutes or so, um, you typically will kill all the fungi and bacteria that might uh, be in there and attack the uh, plants. In addition, at the same time, um, the uh, containers themselves are typically washed um, and in a uh, a washing media that will kill the fungi and bacteria. Um, what's typically used is a mixture of just regular water and chlorine bleach. So recapping both sections of this unit, aquaponics is a combination of aquaculture and hydroponics. Aquaponics may be the most efficient method of food production in terms of inputs versus outputs of any of the systems that we've looked at. Most aquaponics systems do require inputs in terms of electricity to run the pumps to circulate water, though solar systems can handle much of it. Um, they also require inputs in terms of fish food. Um, container growing can provide higher yields than in-soil growing for certain crops. 
and is suited to indoor or outdoor growing. It can be done indoors under lights, indoors in greenhouses, or outdoors. It can be done in hoop houses as well. Container growing can be done on ground unsuitable for traditional growing. So you may have areas where you couldn't plant something in the ground. Uh, maybe it's paved, maybe it's all gravel, whatever. Um, as long as it can be leveled enough that the containers can be stood up, containers can be used on that ground. And container growing can make very efficient use of inputs, especially water, when compared to traditional agriculture. So there you have it, and that concludes Unit 6.